Hello and welcome. In this lecture, uh, we will uh, find out the time response of a second order system. So, we will start from the general equation of the second order system, uh, which is represented here. And by the end of this lecture, we will be able to derive a more elaborate form of the second order system, which is the transfer function shown in this blue box. Let us get started. So, as uh, you have noticed that in the first order system, uh, when we were uh, uh, finding the time response of the first order system, there was only one parameter, which was the time constant of the system. And uh, by changing the time constant of the system, we were able to change only the speed of the response. But in second order system, we have two poles. If you recall the S plane, there is a real axis and an imaginary axis. And only if the roots are on the left hand side of the imaginary axis, the system will be stable. When we talk about the second order system, there are uh, four different possibilities. Because the roots can, be, can have four different kind of values. And based on these values, the response of the second order system will change. And not only the speed of the response, but also the form or shape of the response will also change. And in this lecture, we will discuss all four of those responses. And then we will be able to define few of the important terms, just like in the first order system. So as you can see that uh, this standard equation of the second order system uh, can have four of these values, which are mentioned here with the red dots. So first possibility is that when both roots uh, are the poles of the system are real, negative and unequal. So it means, uh, for example, one pole is uh, minus three, the other pole is minus five. So both are real, both are negative and both are unequal. The second possibility is that they are real, negative, but they are equal. Both poles are minus four, both poles are minus five, values like these. The third possibility is that both roots are on imaginary axis. So if they are on imaginary axis, so they must be both uh, conjugate of each other. So they don't have any real part, they only have imaginary part. The fourth possibility is that they both are complex conjugate. It means that they have real and imaginary both parts. So now let's see that how this will affect the response of the system. But before that, we will discuss uh, what uh, those four forms look like and then we will attach those four forms to a particular uh, group of poles. So these are those four different forms. Uh, one possibility is that the system's response is oscillatory. It's continuously oscillating in a sinusoidal fashion or sinusoidal wave. This is called undamped response. The second possibility is that the system oscillates little bit but then stabilizes. So this is called underdamped. The third possibility is that system straight away goes to its final value. So it, this is called critically damped. And the fourth possibility is that system goes to the final value, but in a very slow manner. So this is called over damped. So these are the four type of responses we have. As we have seen that in the first order system, the response was only just like a curve like this. So in the first order system, the response was always of this shape. It was a, just a uh, exponential curve and it, the system was achieving a final value, something like this. But in here, we have four different kind of curves. So now we will discuss uh, which kind of poles will result in what kind of curve. So the first case is a second order system with negative unequal real poles. In this case, as you can see here that the response of the system will be over damped. So first I will just uh, explain that uh, what kind of response uh, we will get in what kind of system and then we will go into some other uh, definition and some further details. So if for example, this kind of uh, system we have in which the equation is s square plus 9 s plus 9. So if you find the roots of this equation using the quadratic formula, you will get values like this, minus seven point something and minus one point something. So these are the poles of the system. And as you can see that both poles are real, they both are negative and they both are distinct. They both are unequal. So in this case, the response will be over damped. And this is the Scilab code. Uh, and uh, I will put the Scilab programs with the course files and you can run this and you can see the response of the system. Now the next is a second order system with negative equal real poles. So in this case, if you find the roots of this equation, this is another example. And if you find the root of this equation, you will find that the roots are both minus three. It means the poles are uh, real, negative, but equal. So in this case, the response of the system will be critically damped. So in this case, 
uh, both of the poles are on imaginary axis. So if you find the roots of this equation, you will notice that both roots are plus minus uh, j3. So j is square root minus 1. In mathematics, we denote it with, an, uh, with iota, but in control system, we normally, we normally denote root minus 1 with j. So these will be the roots of this. So in this case, the response will be a sinusoidal or undamped because this is not going to damp, this is always uh, going to continue like uh, in a sinusoidal wave. Now the last case is when the roots have both real and imaginary components. So it means it is uh, the roots are in the left half plane, either in the uh, third, uh, second quadrant or in the third quadrant, left half plane uh, or on the left hand side of the imaginary axis. So both roots will be complex conjugate uh, of each other. As you can see here that the first root is a uh, minus 1 plus j8 and the second root is minus 1 minus j8. So in this case the response will be under damped. It means the, uh, the system will oscillate and finally it will achieve some value. And this type of imp uh, response is very important because most of the control systems in real life are under damped system. And uh, if you uh, find the output response uh, CT of uh, this system you will find this uh, result. And uh, uh, how we do that? There are separate videos, at least two videos describe how to get to, uh, how to get these response. I have uh, made a complete derivation, but I will explain this in next slide. But for what we do here is in order to find the output response, we multiply the input with the control, uh, with the transfer function, and then we get CS. And then we make the partial fraction of CS and Finally, we go from S domain to time domain and we get these values. So if you uh, want to see further example of this, I have made a separate video, a very long video, 30 minute video in which I have taken another example of complex conjugate poles and in that example I have uh, solved each and every step of these uh, calculations. And it's a very good video, you can, uh, if you have time, if, if you have problem with this, you can watch that video. So I will quickly go through this. So this is the output, uh, you multiply input with the control system and you get the output. Actually, there is a comma here and uh, you get this. And then what we do, we find the uh, constant of the partial fractions, A, B, C. We equate the coefficient, coefficient of S square and S and we find A, B and C. And then we get this equation this one. So this is the simplified form of the uh, output response in S domain and then we split this equation and then we try to make these two forms because we know that if we have this form then the Laplace in inverse will be simply this formula and if we have this form then the Laplace in one inverse will be this. So this can be easily split it into these two type of equations as you can see that S plus 2 can be written as S plus 1 divided by the denominator plus 1 divided by the same denominator. Very simple. So then if you look at here and you compare it with this, you will see that this is exactly like this equation for which we have a very easy formula of Laplace inverse. So we have made this form, so we apply this formula here, so we get this thing here and similarly for the second part, this one, we apply this second formula, we compare it, you can just compare it with this one and you will see that it is exactly k is 1 and this one is A. So we apply this, this formula for this one, second part. And then by using another trigonometric identity, which is this one, this very important trigonometric identity. Uh, I have explained this in uh, the, that video. We use this identity and we uh, transform this response into one single angle response which is the cause of the single angle. Now we have to represent this uh, system in a quantitative way. So we want to uh, make some definitions here and some more in-depth understanding of the second order system. Just uh, uh, up to now we have just looked at the system with the perspective of poles, but now we want to look at the system with the perspective of frequency. So and uh, this frequency analysis I will discuss later when we'll, we will do the frequency analysis. But at the moment I am just defining few terms, so just uh, bear with me and uh, get the understanding of these basic terms and then we have to do the uh, frequency domain analysis of the control systems later. So this is the starting point. So first is the natural frequency. So this is the frequency of oscillation of the system without damping. So if there is no damping then the system will continue to oscillate. 
in a sinusoidal way. So the frequency of oscillation in that case would be omega n. Now what is the damping ratio? The damping ratio is denoted by zeta and this is the ratio of the exponential decay and I am going to define this in the next slide. So this is the ratio of the exponential decay frequency to the natural frequency. So natural frequency is uh, already here and what is the exponential decay frequency? I will show you next. Now the purpose of defining these two terms is that we want to move from the general form of this general this form of the second order system to a more elaborate form which contains a frequency and damping ratio. So that is why we want to transform this into an equation which has these two values and you will understand the reason when we will do the frequency domain analysis of the control system that how useful are these parameters. Now we have defined omega n as the frequency of the system when there is no damping and when there is no damping or the undamped case then the root will be on the imaginary axis and we will get the root something like uh, I am giving you a number just plus minus 3 into j. So this will be the value of the roots. And because in this case there, there will be no damping, those what will be the frequency of the system? What will be the omega? Omega will be the natural frequency of the system. And what is here? What is this 3 thing? What is this 3? Three? 3 is basically omega. So it means omega whatever is this constant, this one, this constant here is basically square of the natural frequency if there is no middle term, if there is no term containing As, then whatever is the constant is the square of the uh, omega n because if we take the root of this we get 3j and this is on the omega axis, this is 3j. So what is 3? 3 is basically omega n, the natural frequency of the system. So this is what we are defining here that we say that S equals to uh, b a square root of b into j if we solve this equation and because there is no middle term in this case, the special case which is undamped case. So then it will be only s equal to s square equal to minus b and s will be equal to this and therefore this square root of b is basically nothing but the natural frequency of the system. And now we are going to define zeta. We, are, we have already defined zeta that zeta is the ratio of the exponential decay frequency and divided by the natural frequency. But the question is what is exponential decay frequency? So exponential decay frequency if you look uh, uh, practically on a, on a system of underdamped type, so this is an underdamped system which I described that most systems are underdamped, they will oscillate for some time and then they will achieve a final value. So in this case what is happening is that their amplitude of oscillation as you can say that this peak is big then this peak goes down, down, down. So what factor is causing this peak to go down and decay. So that part is basically an exponential thing which we have already discussed in the first order system. So that is basically this A part of the equation, A part of the general equation of the second order system which is the real part of the pole because real part of the pole causes an exponential uh, form. So this is the same as in first order system, there was only one pole but that pole was causing an exponential term an exponential shape of the curve. So similarly the same thing is happening here because this underdamped system uh, has uh, poles which has both real and imaginary values. So uh, if you solve this equation you will get uh, minus 1 uh, square root 8 of j. In this case because the roots have both real and imaginary components, so the imaginary component is, component is trying to oscillate but the real component, component is suppressing, suppressing this too. Uh, get a final value. If this is a, the real component of the root will be a divided by 2. So if you have solved the quadratic equation, you will know that if I solve this quadratic equation, basically the coefficient of s would be uh, twice of the real part of the root of this equation. So therefore the real part which is affecting this is basically a divided by 2 and real part is causing this thing. So real part is the exponential decay frequency. In the first order system, we define the time constant as 1 divided by A. So 1 divided by A, this whole thing are the tau, tau has the unit of time. 
so 1 divided by a has the unit of time so what will be the unit of a the unit of a will be frequency we have discussed this thing in, in in that lecture so this sigma is basically the real part of the root of the equation is basically the exponential decay frequency and this sigma is also equal to half of the value of a if we write this in general form so it means that we can now uh, put zeta in a mathematical form that zeta equals to exponential decay frequency divided by natural frequency so it means sigma divided by omega n and sigma is a by 2 a by 2 divided by omega n so a will be equal to 2 zeta omega n so this is how we reach at the value of a so now what we can do we can put this value into our standard form b divided by s square plus a s plus b so instead of b we can put omega n square instead of a we can put 2 zeta omega n and this is also b so now we got this equation so this is the more elaborate or more explained or more detailed equation of the second order system because we know that uh, an under damped control system has some oscillations as well if you look at the previous slide you will see that this system also has some oscillations. So we have defined, if we go further back, this is an undamped system which, which only has oscillations. So the frequency of this oscillation is omega n, but this system also has oscillation and the frequency of this oscillation is omega d. So this is called the damped natural frequency. And now we are going to define uh, this damped natural frequency. So what is omega d? Omega d is basically the value of the imaginary part and this is the actual frequency of the sinusoidal in an under damped system because under damped system will not oscillate continuously like a sine wave but what it will oscillate will uh, depend on omega d how much it has to it will oscillate. Now we have three things natural frequency which is the frequency of the undamped system then we have the damping ratio and then we have the third thing which is the damped natural frequency which is the actual frequency of the sinusoidal uh, in the under damped system. So now the question is whether these terms are related or not and the answer is yes these three terms are related. This omega d if you derive this equation and I will do this in the next slide in the next video. So if you uh, derive you can easily see and we and we will see in the next video when we will go into details that basically this omega d is square root of 1 minus zeta square omega n. So this is the value of this uh, omega d because all these formulas we will be discussing in next video. This video was just an introductory video about the response of the second order system. In the next four slides I will explain some of the concepts of second order system and also uh, some similar concept which we have already discussed in the first order system. In this image as you can see that uh, this is the under damped second order system it oscillates uh, come down down and finally it achieves the value. So there are three important things uh, uh, you should understand here that uh, until the system reaches uh, within a certain limit which we define 2 percent you can define 5 percent until the system reaches that limit within 2 percent of the final value this time is called the transient response. So this is the transient response of the system in which there are a lot of oscillations and this response is very important these oscillations can cause uh, a lot of damage we don't want these oscillations to be too big so that our system fails in in the initial stage of the system and then once the system has achieved a final value then that is called the steady state response the difference between the intended value and the actual value is called, called the steady state error now this is the response of under damp system and what I want to highlight here is that if the damping ratio is low it means the system will have more oscillations. So this is the damping ratio of 0.1 as we increase the damping ratio if we go from minus 1 to minus 2 you see the oscillations have reduced. So as you can see here that as damping increases how the response of the system varies. These are the few terms which we have already defined for the first order system. So we are redefining uh, same terms for the second order system that we say that the uh, rise time is the time from 
10% to 90% and the time difference between these two is the rise time of the system. Then similarly, we have already defined settling time is the time uh, in which the system reaches within 2% of the uh, final value. So when the system reaches within this band, because this is the second order system, in the first order system, system never uh, overshoots never go beyond the final value system just reaches the final value or less than that so when the system is within the two percent plus or minus so this is two percent plus this is two percent minus then this time is called settling time so this is the final value and from this to this uh, point the, which is the uh, c maximum so this is called the overshoot of the system so first order system do not have this but second order system has this which is the under dam system which is the most important kind of system out of those four types. So now we will discuss uh, some of the transient response uh, of the system. So before the system reaches uh, its uh, final value and we will see that uh, how by changing the position of the pole can affect the form of the response. So this is the first situation in which uh, our real part is same and the imaginary part of the poles is increasing. So these are three different systems. So all have the same uh, real part as you can see that it's uh, going vertical up. So it means the real part is same. Real part is the distance from uh, origin on the left hand side. So now as you can see because the real part uh, governs this exponential envelope. So this uh, kind of envelope, this is created by the real part. And because the real part of all these three systems is same, so it means that although the frequency is high for the system three, because system three has a more imaginary component, it is higher on the imaginary axis. So it has a lot of higher frequency, but still it is in the same envelope, because this envelope is controlled by the real part of the pole. So this is a, you should try to think about and try to imagine that uh, by looking at the real and imaginary part of a pole, how can you uh, in your mind uh, take a picture of the behavior of the response. So if the real part is same, the envelope will be same and whatever is the frequency that will stay within the envelope, under the envelope. And there is a mistake in this slide which I noticed here that in this case, this is constant real part. This is constant real part, not imaginary. This is a mistake. In this diagram, as you can see now that we are increasing the real part. We are going away from the imaginary axis. It means the real part is going more in the negative side. You will see that this second part, the second part damps out more quickly it damps, it damps more quickly, it loses all its height more quickly and it reaches the maximum value because now we have a real component which is far away from the imaginary axis. So it means it will damp out more quickly because as the value of A increases, the real part of the system, the real part uh, increases, it means the exponential part decays out more quickly. So this is what is happening here. Although the frequency is same, no, the frequency of both is same as you can see exactly same frequency because the imaginary part is same. So frequency is same. Now this is the uh, another uh, uh, diagram in which we are going away from uh, by increasing both real and imaginary components. So if you go on a straight line from origin like this, so this is the constant zeta line. In the, the value above the final value is now same. The same overshoot is happening here. So as you can see that uh, number three, which is the far away from the imaginary axis, which has the more real component, uh, still you can see that it uh, damps out more quickly because it has a more real component into it. It, it is away from the imaginary axis. So it has more real part. So if the real part is more, so it means the response will dies out, uh, will damp out more quickly. On this line, uh, the zeta is constant. The damping ratio is constant. The ratio of the exponential decay and the natural frequency is constant. So therefore the overshoot is constant. So this is controlling the overshoot. And now these are the few terms. The peak time, the time required to reach the first or the maximum peak. 
So, this is called the peak time, these two have we have already defined and then the percent overshoot is the amount that waveform overshoots the final steady state value. So, TP expressed as a percentage of the final steady state value. So, we uh, will define and we will actually get the formulas for these parameters in the next video. But for now, you just uh, have to understand what is rise time, what is settling time, what is peak time and what is the overshoot or percent overshoot. So, percent overshoot is the overshoot expressed in percent. So, in the next video, we will try to uh, either solve some problems or try to find out the formulas for these uh, variables.